Well, hello, my name is Dan Doriani. I'm a professor at Covenant Theological Seminary. I wish I could be with you in person, but uh, the reality we have uh, today is that so very often uh, we speak by video, and I hope this is still an encouragement to you as you consider your calling in life. Um, I've been invited to speak on the topic of a Christian and calling and work, and I've chosen 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as my text. If you would, uh, you could turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning in verse 17. This is the Apostle Paul, and he's talking about callings and places in life. And, of course, that's uh, a topic of perennial interest to believers, disciples, in all phases of life. This is what Paul says. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him, and to which God has called him. This is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his calling uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bond servant when called? Don't be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity, or could be translated simply, do so. If you can gain your freedom, do so. For he who was called in the Lord as a bond servant or a slave is a freed man of the Lord. Likewise, he was free when he was called as a bondservant or a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants or slaves of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. I want to start with a uh, word of prayer and then a, a simple story that perhaps we all know. Heavenly Father, guide us, we pray, as we seek um, your will and your guidance for us as we um, try to find the callings, the way to serve you, and the way to consider our lot in life. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, in 2001, there was a very famous event, uh, the attack on the Twin Towers in New York City. And as you know, two planes crashed into the World Trade Center, and as thousands of office workers were streaming down the stairways, there were firemen and other rescue workers rushing up the stairs to try to rescue trapped workers. So one, one group is running away from danger, the other group is running toward danger, and everyone was amazed and thankful for men who risked their lives, a few women, but mostly men certainly, who risked their lives to save others. And they called them true heroes. And yet when they were interviewed after that, they said over and over again, we're not heroes, we were just doing our job. We would say, perhaps, they're not heroes, they were just fulfilling their calling. Now, that's actually what people say when they are working in their calling. If you talk to mothers of twins, they'll say, uh, you know, I'm just a mother of twins. I mean, it's hard, but that's my lot in life. That's my place. That's, that's my calling. Uh, surgeons who operate on people for two or five or ten or... 12 hours, um, say, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not a hero. I'm just doing my job. It's what I was, what I was trained to do. Now, that, that experience is actually what most people hope to find, the sense that as they work, they're not heroic. They're just doing what they were made to do, doing what they were trained to do. And the church doesn't always help us, and society doesn't always help us on this front. Uh, we want an experience of calling to be gratifying and, and fulfilling, in whatever we do, whatever our occupation, I know um, some are considered more noble than others, but whether you're cooking food or you're an engineer or you're working on finance or inventing things or in the healthcare field, education, we want our, our work uh, to matter. We want to feel good about it. We want to feel that God has placed us there. Now, the church doesn't always help us because, historically speaking, the Catholic Church said that priests are called... And everyone else is doing ordinary work. Everyone else is a, is a layman or doing secular work. Now, Martin Luther, followed by Calvin, John Calvin, tried to correct this. And he said, you know, the milkmaid milking her cows and the farmer in the fields. And he even said, you know, the soldier 
slaying the enemies. These people are all doing their work to the glory of God and please God as much as anybody else as they serve in their calling. The farmer in the fields, the magistrate dispensing justice, please God as much as anyone else. Now, people have criticized Luther for saying that, you know, wherever you are, that's your calling because that leads to a relatively static view and doesn't leave much room for social reform. Uh, but if you look at the Bible, there's another reason to question Luther, although we're grateful for what he said. And that is that in the Bible, the term calling is usually used to describe God's call of people to himself. That is to say, the call of salvation. And so we're not quite sure if the word calling is the right term for uh, the jobs that we have. On the secular side, uh, there's a man named Abraham Maslow who... Uh, wrote a piece that has had tremendous impact over the years. And then he said, people have a hierarchy of needs. First, they need food and clothing and shelter. And then they need friendship and companionship and security, love and acceptance. And when all those needs are met, then they will seek significance and achievement and self-actualization. The term self-actualization is actually entered a vocabulary and our parlance for years and and has led people to think, well, I need to find fulfillment and significance. I need to make sure my job is 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 fun and actualizes me. Now the church still has some problems with the concept of calling. Um, the idea probably still lingers in minds of many Christians that uh, to be a pastor or missionary is the best possible lot in life and then to be in business is uh, to do secular work which isn't quite as good so a pastor is in full-time service now unfortunately even in full-time service there are certain hierarchies in people's minds so i'm a professor at a seminary and although i'm ordained and i'm in full-time christian service i don't readily think of myself as quite the servant a pastor is I've been a pastor for a number of years, and I know that actually being a pastor is harder than being a professor because you're with people and the distresses and traumas of life. But even pastors have their ranks or priorities. You know, a senior pastor is more important than a youth pastor, and a missionary, of course, does all the same work, except they do it overseas, far from home, in a different language. And even missionaries have their ranks, so that you have, you know, a missionary in Western Europe is uh, far inferior to, to a missionary uh, working in, in Africa. And a missionary working in Africa who's in the capital city is, is not suffering for the Lord as much as a frontier missionary. And, uh, of course, at the pinnacle of it all is perhaps a, a Bible translator with almost no friends in a remote village working in a snake-infested tree hut with rain falling on him or her every day. Now, when we put it that way, we understand that it's nonsense. But what we really want to say is that all callings that serve God and serve our neighbor have a, have a level of nobility to them, and they please God, and they advance his kingdom in this world. Let me say that make the same point a different way. A number of years ago, there was a, a man who was quite wealthy who ran for president. And he released his tax records as is customary to do when you run for president. And, and people poured over those records and they found that he had uh, made, you know, close to a million dollars in the year they were uh, examining. And he'd only given $600 to charity. And people asked him, why are you so stingy? And he answered, well, I've given my life to public service. I'm serving people every day. Why do I have to give money on top of that. Now that's actually akin to the Christian idea that if you're a pastor or a missionary or a priest or a monk or whatever the case might be, you're more noble than the ordinary person. This politician's mind, a politician is a public servant and higher than anybody else. And I wanted to ask him if I could have been alone with him, uh, what would you say um, if all the politicians and all the doctors and all the bread makers and all the garbage collectors disappeared on the same day, who would we miss first and who would we miss most? Well, the answer, of course, is bread makers and, and garbage men is who we'd miss first 
and we don't actually pay them or respect them all that well in our society. But maybe the real point is that we should try to get rid of our hierarchies and instead serve in the place that God gives us. It's better to say all vocations, all jobs that are honest and truly serve people, please God and please society. I'm going to ask you to maybe consider a few diagnostic questions you might have, and this would apply to corporate leaders or cashiers, uh, cabinet makers and ice makers, whoever you might be. The first one is, uh, are you honing the skills that God gave you by birth? Are you honing the skills that were given to you in the genetic lottery? Number one. Number two, uh, parents, other family members, teachers, mentors have invested in you. Are you making the most of that investment? And then number three, are you, if you're employed, using your skills to provide for your family? And the fourth question is, are you promoting the good of your neighbors? Are you promoting the good of mankind or just taking care of yourself in your work, whether it's the work you do now or the work you'll do in the future? And could you say that you are answering the legitimate prayers of God's people by what you do? People pray, give us this day our daily bread. Are you somehow meeting daily needs, food, clothing, shelter, medical care, education, something that's clearly of value? Uh, to put it a different way, if you find yourself doing work that adds just about nothing to society, you probably should look for another job. Now, if your work is completely immoral, like drug running or, or uh, you know, selling armaments illegally, you should stop at once. And if your work is borderline meaningless, perhaps you should look for a job quickly. I was going to a baseball game uh, one time, and uh, there was a child in the, in the group and there was a, a cotton candy salesman hawking cotton candy. And he has this tower of cotton candy, probably two feet tall. And it's multicolored, this mountain of sugary fluff that probably weighed about an ounce and a half. And the, the eyes of this little girl are just bedazzled. And she wants cotton candy. And I, and I couldn't help but think, would I want to sell cotton candy? I mean, it's not good for the little girl, for her teeth, and, and probably sets up a little warfare between the parents and the child. She wants what she sees, and the parents think she should eat something more healthy. Uh, maybe you shouldn't do that. Somebody else may say, well, you know, he's just trying to make a living. And besides, who made you the cotton candy police? And so we can debate some of these matters, but I will say if you find yourself in a trivial job or a job that's destructive, even if not illegal, you should look for something else. Now, the first thing we want in the inf under the influence of people like Abraham Maslow when we look for a job is probably satisfaction. Uh, one time when I was at a summer camp in uh, some mountains, uh, we were in a very safe place, and my wife and I decided to cut loose our then seven-year-old child and she loved the streams and loved to explore the hills around our camp. And, and, and she came back a couple hours later with a box full of, of newts and efts and moss and grass and showed it all to us and then, and then exulted, I was made for this. Now, that feeling, I was made for this, is probably what most people seek. The question is, uh, can we get it? And it should we really aim for it? Is it the most important thing to feel satisfied with yourself? Our society tells us so, but the truth of the matter is, it's only people who are from the West with a high quality education, with you know supportive parents and good mentors and access to a high quality education who have anything like access to a job they were made for. Most people throughout the years do what they were given to do. Farmers farm because their parents did. And merchants bought and sold because that was the trade of their family. And so we have to pull back a little bit on the idea that we should do what we most want to do. So what does the Bible have to say to us about our calling? Well, the first thing I want to tell you is the Bible really says, above all, God's call is to Christ. 
Paul says to the Romans, you are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Uh, you are, he says a little bit later, loved by God and called to be saints. In 1 Corinthians, the book we're reading right now, he says we we're also called into fellowship with God's Son. And Paul says elsewhere that we're called according to his purpose to be conformed to his Son, to Jesus Christ. And we should lay hold of the calling that God has given us, Paul says in another place. Take hold of the eternal life to which you are called. Make a good confession of faith. So the first calling we have is actually universal. We all share the same call, the call to faith and the call to conformity to Christ, to be more and more like him. But then, of course, we do have places in life and circumstances in life. And if you have your Bibles nearby, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, which I read part of to you earlier, there's actually a long discussion of various questions that the people in Corinth uh, put to Paul. And the first question uh, touches a person who is married to an unbeliever. And the question essentially goes like this. If I'm married to an unbeliever, should I divorce that person? Can I really serve Christ in my home if my spouse doesn't share my faith? And Paul says, um, actually, you should stay together, stay married, even if your unbelieving spouse uh, seems recalcitrant toward the faith. But then he does add something at the end. And I need to find a pair of glasses so I can read this. At the end, he says, now, look, I want you to stay married. This is God's calling. This is the life God's appointed to you. Um, but it is true that if an unbelieving husband or wife wants to leave, let them leave. So what he's saying is, and he adds, God has called us to peace. You, know, you can't force somebody to stay married to you. In those days, a lot like today, marriage was essentially uh, entered at will and, and ended at will. If somebody simply walked out of the house and walked over the nearest hillside and said, I'm not coming back, there's almost nothing you do to preserve the marriage. And Paul says, if they're bound and determined to go, let them go. God's called you to peace. Now, there's a pattern here. And the pattern is stay where you are, stay married to an unbeliever, unless they resolve to leave and they do leave you because you can't be married to somebody who is gone. Because, because God has called us to peace. Now that's the pattern, stay unless because. And it shows up several times in 1 Corinthians. It also is used for single people. He says, look, if you're single, stay single unless you're burning with sexual passion. You can't control it because God calls us to holiness. So the pattern is stay unless because. Now the third question that's asked, number one, should I get married? Number two, what if my spouse leaves me? Number three, what if I'm in a situation in life that I don't like? What if I am a slave, a bond servant, our translation says. But really it means a slave. Now slavery in the ancient world was not the same as slavery today. Most people could escape slavery. They could save money. They could earn money to get out of slavery. And it wasn't an issue of one race or ethnicity that was enslaving another that was enslaved. But people were enslaved. And people also were very unhappy with their ethnicity. And Paul addresses the person who's a Jew, circumcised, who wishes he wasn't so he could fit into Greco-Roman society. And he also addresses the person who's uh, a, a Greek who wishes he was Jewish for whatever reason. And Paul says the same thing really uh, three times over in verses 17 to 24. He says, stay in the position you were in when you were called. If, if you're a Jew, don't let it bother you. If you're a, if you're a a Gentile, don't let it bother you. We would say today, if, if you don't like your ethnic heritage, if you think your parents uh, came from the wrong background or aren't the right kind of person, don't let it bother you. That was God's purpose, God's calling to put you in that family, to let you come from that town or that city or that state or that nation. Stay where you are. Now, it's really shocking that Paul says, if you were a slave and you were called, don't let it bother you. And he quickly adds, of course, if you can gain your freedom, you should do so. Now, how can he say this? Well, he says it because the Christian is in a position that um, relativizes all of their social situation. So if you're, if you're a slave, 
if you're an enslaved person, you're actually free in Christ. And your freedom in Christ transcends the limitations that you have because of your enslaved condition. Oh, and by the way, if you're free, if you think you're free, you're actually not because you're a servant, even a slave of Christ. You're answerable to him. You don't get to do as you please. You have a master, namely your Lord. Now, this doesn't mean Paul's endorsing slavery or indifferent to slavery. He says if you can gain your freedom, do so. And he also says that you should not become a slave. You should do everything you can to avoid becoming a slave. And there are different ways you could become a slave in the ancient world. They're different from maybe what we know from American history. But he is saying this. There is no universal right to simply flee a situation you're in because you don't like it. So slavery isn't really, or being enslaved isn't exactly a calling because it's so corrosive. But it is a, a social status. It's a condition for work. And Paul does say, stay where you are. Now that applies uh, to us, I think, pretty clearly. Because everybody is in bondage in some way. You say, well, the CEO is a free agent. He can, he can do whatever he wants. The person who owns their own business. Well, the CEO is, is not free. But let's start at the under, other end of the spectrum. Let's, let's talk about the secretary. The secretary certainly seems to be beholden to the boss. The boss, of course, belongs to a higher boss, and the higher boss belongs to the CEO. But the CEO is not free. The CEO belongs to the board, and the board belongs to the stockholders, and therefore everybody is beholden to someone. Or let's take a university. The university students think, well, I'm the lowest person here. I, I do whatever the professor says. The professor is in charge. But the professor is not free. The professor belongs to the dean. And the dean belongs to the provost. And the provost belongs to or serves the president. And serve, the president serves the board. And if it's a state university, the board answers to the legislature. And the legislature ans answers to the citizens, which means, in a sense, that everybody in the whole state is the boss of the president. In a way, students, if they vote, are the boss of the president. So everyone is responsible to someone. No one is absolutely free. That's what Paul's saying. Again, he says, of course, if you're enslaved and you can buy your way out of it, by all means, do so. Now let's apply this to the person who thinks work should be more than a place of employment. It should be the place for fulfillment and self-actualization. And, and I already commented on that for a moment and said, uh, that's something that's really only available to relatively few people in human history. It's available to people who have food, clothing, shelter, love, and much more already provided for them. And I know I'm mostly speaking to people who are at this high end of society, to relatively elite people with this wonderful education. And most, most of you have a strong work ethic. Uh, but still... We can't imagine that I will go and find work that will always be fulfilling to me personally. On the other hand, the Bible does say we should enjoy our work. Uh, it's, it's good to work cheerfully, to work gladly. Romans 12 says this, it's good, Ecclesiastes says, for a laborer to toil, enjoy his work, come home, eat and sleep. It's also uh, true that when we're in the field we deeply love, the time seems to go fast. I'm a professor, and one of the professors who mentored me told me at one point, I teach for free. They pay me to grade papers. Uh, I probably would give this lecture for free if it hadn't taken me half an hour to set up the recording system. I speak at conferences for free. They pay me to get in a plane and sleep in a strange bed. Now, that sentiment, I do this for free, I would do this for free if money were no object, that suggests that we're in a place that we really love, that we're in the, in the right place. On the other hand, it's also true that very often we can't find that sweet spot, that place that we most want. That's partly because our roles are ascribed to us by society. Now, long ago, if you were from a farming family, you were probably going to be a farmer. If you were from a trading family, you would probably be in the trades. And 
teachers beget teachers and medical folk beget medical folk and so on. And so a role is often largely prescribed or ascribed. And what Paul would say to people in that spot is that you should find yourself in your calling. Stay where you are. God has called you to peace. Stay in the situation in which God called you. Don't think to yourself, I need to escape. Now, Martin Luther emphasized that. He said, look, if you're a farmer and you're chafing against the work of, a, of the farm, find your contentment in what you do every hour. Relax and accept the place you have in life. John Calvin adjusted that a little bit. And he said, well, you know, there are, there are some structures that are fallen. And not everything that a farmer does is something a farmer should do. We can strive for social reform. If we talk about a soldier, we could say, well, if I'm a soldier, I'm a soldier. But on the other hand, maybe we can find a better way to keep the peace and to have fewer wars. Paul says you were bought at a price. Don't become the slaves of men. And he means we can find freedom wherever we are. Now, if you look at Christian teaching on calling, the dominant message is that you'll hear, maybe you've uh, not heard it yet, but as time goes by, you will, is that what we need to do is seek an internal call, that is to say, our feeling of what we should do, what we want to do with our life, and an external call, that is to say, somebody says, ah, here's a job, I want to offer you a job, and everything is perfect when the internal and the external come together. So I want to be an architect or an engineer, I desire that, I get the training, I get into the school I want, and I, I get a good internship, and then somebody offers me a job that's the perfect life. And of course, we would say, of course, uh, we would say it is good if you get the job you've always uh, trained for. It goes a little bit uh, sideways when we say something like follow your passion. Because our passions are often somewhat off. When I was young, I wanted to be a major league baseball player when I was nine seven, eight, nine, ten years old. And then by the time I was 12, and it was clear that I was a pretty good Little League baseball player, but there were other players who were better, it dawned on me, if I'm not dominating Little League, I'm probably never going to make the major leagues. It took me maybe three years to come to that conclusion and to give up my aspiration to be a professional baseball player. Well, something like that happens to a lot of people. Somebody says, I want to be an actor, and... The voice or the face or um, something isn't quite right. And somebody says, well, if you want to stay in in entertainment industry, there's a place for you behind the camera. And maybe you can be a script writer. Or maybe you can be a showrunner. And maybe you desire, somebody desires to be a lead singer. And they say, well, you've got a wonderful voice. You can be a backup singer. You have a backup singer quality voice, not a solo headlining voice. To say it a different way, if somebody wants to be an architect or an engineer, that doesn't mean you have a right to be an architect or an engineer. In fact, the desire to be an architect doesn't even necessarily get you into an architectural program. You have to meet the qualifications. So follow your passion is, a, um, is something we see in our culture that doesn't always lead to a job and doesn't always lead to the right job either. Now, behind this idea that I need to pay attention to my passion and hope it matches up the internal call and the external call. Hope those match up. Behind that is something that a Christian should notice is a miss. And the problem is this, it leaves God out of the picture. So if we're examining my internal desires and the job I'm offered, where's God? Now a man named John Frame, who is a fine theologian, uh, said, let's fix this, and let's talk about calling, and let's put God in the center. And he does it in four steps. First, he says, God gives people gifts that they can use to glorify him and serve their neighbors. Second, God sends the Holy Spirit so we can discern our gifts fallibly through self-examination and the encouragement or the constructive criticism of others, or the confirmation of others. Third, God provides opportunities for us to explore, to develop our gifts. And finally, God grants us wisdom 
to use our gifts to glorify him and to serve his people in the place that he has for us. Back to verse 17 and 20 and 24. Stay in the place in which you are called. Serve God where you are. Now this pushes us away from focusing on our subjective feelings. And instead it pushes us to emphasize God's role in giving gifts and giving us opportunities to use those gifts. So it goes something like this. We have um, maybe a core desire or aspiration that comes out of a sense that I'm good at something. So one of my grandchildren is uh, just fantastic at math for her early age. And she loves to do math problems. And, and maybe she'll become a mathematician. And, and that gift she has, it's just been there since she was very little. She could add numbers and subtract numbers in her head could lead to a desire for a career in something mathematical like engineering or architecture, which I've mentioned before. But then that desire has to somehow come to expression. And, and she's going to volunteer or you're going to volunteer to do something and you're going to give it a try. And, and somebody will say, well, thank you very much for that effort. And I, I see some promise there. Um, why don't you come back, you know, why don't you come back and be part of our team, be a substitute member of our team, be a helper on our team. And if you do that for a couple of years and you're volunteering or working part-time and people are pouring energy into you because they see some skill, that may lead in turn to a full-time job. And that full-time job will lead you to, ideally, see how wonderful this calling is as it has levels that you weren't aware of when you first wanted it, and that will increase your desire all the more. So ideally, there's sort of a circle that, or a, a triangle that, that feeds desire to trying things, to being hired, hired, learning more and more with the good mentors, and the desire grows more and more and spirals ever onward. And, the, and, and, and at the center of that circle is a God-given gift or a God-given ability. Now, mentors are important for this, and we have to listen to our mentors as we're looking for our calling. Suppose someone is a very good pianist and um, he or she decides to uh, play with a little quartet, uh, maybe, maybe some group of students or maybe a worship team. And you're filling in, they're looking for a pianist because the regular pianist is away. And if at the end of the session, uh, the leader says, thanks so much for filling in, thanks for your effort, and you never hear from them again, that means probably you've been assessed as not fitting in with the team yet. Your skills aren't high enough. If, on the other hand, they say, hey, that was great. Thanks for filling in. If we need a substitute again, we'll call on you if you're interested. Well, that means, you know, somebody thinks you have the calling. And then maybe you find out somehow, maybe this woman or this man finds out somehow that not only can... Uh, he will make it a he for the moment. Not only can he play the piano, but he can also play almost anything as a keyboard. And then a little while later, starts noticing people playing the guitar. And somebody says, well, it's easy to get started. And, and he picks up the guitar quickly. And, and they say, oh, well, you can, you can fill in on a keyboard, not just the piano. And you can also play the guitar. Oh, and you, you can handle the rhythm, too, because pianos and guitars both have a rhythm component to them. And pretty soon, you're up a multi-instrumentalist or a poly-instrumentalist and the band wants you to fill in somehow or other almost every week. Now that might mean you're supposed to be a musician. It might mean in the long run that you're going to be a composer and it helps you be able to play. Or it might mean that you're going to be a music manager, a music technician. In other words, as we, as we examine our gifts, we're not quite sure where it's going to spiral off into a different direction. We have to do is get that, that feedback from the people around us and also pray and seek God's leading to ensure that we're not just pleasing ourselves or making money, but also serving the people around us. The questions would go like this. Do I have a desire and an ability that lets me not only provide for myself, but meet a human need? Can I remedy a deficit? Am I doing so, can I do so in a way that leads to employment? What people will I serve? 
where will I serve? Even a traveling band has a core, a base, a home city. Even a traveling entertainer has a base. Some people who depend on him or her were the core of their support team, a place where they sleep. And beyond the questions, how can I serve? Where can I serve? How can I improve the lot of the people around me? We also need to ask the question, what burden shall I bear? Because every job is difficult and every job there's, there's a taking out the garbage aspect. And in every job there's also pain. So what pain from this world do you think you might be willing to alleviate? Now you see how different this sounds from our secular perspective, which says, I need to satisfy myself, actualize myself. If we're becoming more and more conformed to Christ, which is our calling, our primary calling, the calling all of us share, all believers share, if our primary serving, primary calling is to be more and more like Christ, then I'm going to look for the place I can serve, the people I can serve, the way I can serve, and like Christ, the burden that I can bear. I want to close with an illustration um, that I perhaps hope will be encouraging to you. In the 2008 Olympics, there was a very, very famous swimmer, perhaps you've heard of him, his name is Michael Phelps, and he was going for eight gold medals, which would have been unprecedented. Now, there was one race that they were least likely to win, and that was the 4 by 100 meter freestyle relay. The French were favored. And the fastest swimmer in the world was on the French team that year. He was running the anchor leg, or swimming the anchor leg. And for the Americans, it wasn't Michael Phelps. It was a man named Jason Lezak, who never seemed to win a big race on his own, but did quite well in relay teams. Jason Lezak was swimming the last lap for the Americans. And when he took... His leap into the pool, he was six-tenths of a second behind Elaine Bernard, who was the world champion and held the all-time world record for the race. So it seemed hopeless that Lezak would catch him. And for a while, he wasn't. And then at 25 meters, Lezak had this thought. He said, you know, you can't give up. This is the Olympics. I find it amazing that people are thinking about giving up in the middle of the race of their life in the Olympics, but this is what Lezak said. He told himself, you can't give up, just give it your best. And he noticed that, that Bernard seemed to be slowing down. Maybe he was pressing a little bit. And so he just, he just kept on swimming, swimming his strokes. And people were screaming because they saw Lezak catching up to Bernard. And there's the famous image of, of Phelps and his teammates jumping up and down, roaring him onto the finish. With 10 meters to go, Lezak was almost even. And as they touched the conclusion of the race, Lezak defeated Bernard by one one hundredth of a second. And it was revealed that he had swum the fastest 100 meters of all time. A man who couldn't seem to win on his own could win for his team. Now, I would offer that to you as, a, as an illustration, maybe an encouragement. Not very many of us are Michael Phelps. Most of us are more like Jason Lezak. But there are enormous things can be done if and only if we're willing to serve on a team, even if and only if we're willing to be something less than the star, to be a supporter, to help others succeed. Certainly, that's the way Christ wants us to live. We have a variety of callings in life, a variety of duties in life. At the very best, a man named Frederick Buechner said, uh, the place God calls you to is that place where your deep gladness and the world's deep need meet. But few of us are always there. In fact, we have many callings. You right now might have a calling as a as a roommate, as a barista, as the point guard on an intramural basketball team. We have callings to be mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. And, and not, not all these fit beautifully our work 
uh, swimmingly all the time. But we can say, this is my work. This is where God has called me. He's called me, first of all, to Christ, and then he's called me to make a difference in this world. And I hope that's so for you.